Yeah, all right. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, technically. I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going to take a little thing to make sure this is recording. Sorry about that. It does say stop recording, therefore it is recording. Okay, so we uh, changed the format here to try to get the glare off the window. I Hopefully it's going to be going good. Amanda, do you need those pillows out of your way? Because uh, David could come pick them out, throw them in the office, or you like them there? Oh, okay. All right. That's just where we want to do. Okay. We're going to get to continue on with James, chapter five. Uh, technically, this is the last part of it, but I don't know if we're going to fit it. So I'm going to call it uh, James, chapter five, our fervent prayer, part one. Okay, because we're, it's probably going to be a two-week portion on this. And I want to talk to you guys. Whoa, good save, girl. Is how many of you prayed and your prayer has not been answered? Amanda, put that on the blue thing. How many of you prayed and your prayer has not been answered? I see one hand. I, I better see everybody's hand up here. Yeah, and, but the scripture says, a fervent prayer that Elijah, the fervent prayer of a righteous man, right? The prayer of a righteous man of Baal's month. The fervent prayer, not just a lackadaisical prayer. Now, I haven't done the whole word search and all that because I think we all know what fervent means. It means you do it. You, you're 100% into it. There's no holding back. You absolutely believe what you believe and you're doing what you're doing. It's a 100% commitment. And most of us, if you're like me, um, you don't go the 100%. So um, God helps us. And God gives us dreams and visions and he, he gives us... Uh, Things to explain how to pray for somebody. And I had a dream the other last middle of last week about my wife. And I haven't explained it to her, so she hasn't heard this. So, And I'm not going to explain it to you guys. But I am going to explain that I've been waiting and questioning little questions, waiting for her answer response. To see if this dream was bad pizza or of God. <laughs> you know, we're to, te we're, to test the <laughs> we're to test the spirits, right? So just because you have a dream that something's going to happen doesn't mean it's of God. It could be of the devil. Or it could just be your mind trying to work out a situation, you know. How to get it. That being said, let's open our Bibles or I'll have it up on screen. But we're going to be in James chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 20. While this is loading up, I'm going to pray. Lord, I do pray. I earnestly pray. I mean, that um, I will be able to speak with your anointing. Your anointing that is going to be able to to equip me to speak this written word as the living rhema word from your mouth, from your own mouth, that each and every person here would be able to hear and understand what you're saying, that Holy Spirit, that I would be able to be your instrument to unplug the ears and remove the scales from people's eyes that they can hear this rhema word of God. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 20 starts out saying like this. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer 
of the faith, of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiving him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the errors of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Amen. I have seen and heard so many different sermons off of this. This is why I don't think I'm going to get this all done today. But that, therefore, we're going to do it verse by verse. We're going to get into this so that you don't walk away confused. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. The very first part of this verse addresses those afflicted and the second, those who are merry. The previous verses were addressing how the rich are the ones oppressing the true followers of Christ. Therefore, our Lord is giving his followers instructions how to fight against the rich and win. So remember, we got to read everything in context. And remember last week, what we were talking about was the oppression of the rich. The rich are the ones who take you to court. The rich are the ones that underpay you. The rich are the ones that withhold your wages. So this address that James is giving is not, I'm going to say it before I get, it's not about having cancer. It's not about having a cold. It's about how to get out of the affliction, the oppression that the rich are imposing on you. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10 through verse 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. See, this scripture here continues on, written by James, I mean by, by Paul, but it continues on telling us that we're to be strong in the might and the power of the Lord. We're not to be weak. We're not to be just following and letting God fight all our battles. We're to fight our battles because God's given us the ability to, to fight the battles against two. It says right here against the devil, against powers and principalities. We Christians are to fight. We need to quit begging God to save us because he already has. We need to quit begging God to get us out of this persecution because he's already given us all the power and we need to start putting on the full armor of God and fight against the devil.
afflicted. Now, this is a hyperlink. You guys could go check this out on Blue Letter Bible, but I just pretty much wrote this down for, because I know a lot of you won't look it up. But it just means to suffer, to endure evil, hardship, and trouble. It doesn't mean to suffer living in a bad marriage. It doesn't mean to suffer working at a hard job. It doesn't mean to suffer cancer or back pain, but to suffer evil, evil hardships, hardships done by the devil. What's he, the thief do? The thief comes but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what we're supposed to endure. Now, if you're merry, what's to be merry about? What's merry? Absolutely. You know, if you're happy, sing songs, you don't need to pray. Now, why would God be telling you if you're happy, don't pray to me? We're to pray to God always, continually, 24-7, right? So that we we know that this stain about when you're hurt, when, when you're afflicted, pray, is different than you just praying. Because I just love you, Lord. I praise you. I'm, you're just awesome, God. I'm Mary. I'm praising God. I'm praying. Now, if you're if you're Mary, it says you're to sing songs. Psalms. Like the book of Psalms. And most people don't understand that. But you know what that word means to sing a psalm? Now he's talking to a group of people that are, by all intents, of mostly Jewish. James is supposedly the first book of the Bible written. It's to a complete Jewish uh, audience. Uh, they hadn't dispersed yet out of Jerusalem. Uh, and James becomes the head of the Jerusalem church. So these are Jews that ex have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. So they know what Psalms are, you know, like what David, King David wrote, what we have in our Bible called Psalms. But Psalms are to pluck, like play on a string instrument, a harp, something, the word of God. But we're to sing <coughs> Psalms. We're just pluck at seeing words that will pluck something out of this affliction. And who are we to, if we're happy, if we're merry, who are we to help? We read the rest of this scripture. If, if you're doing good, you need to go help the person that's not doing so good. You need to sing the power of God, the promises of God over that person to pluck them out of affliction. Because, there, yeah, there's Kleenex right over there. Because a lot of us, when your kids die, when, when you lose your job, when some your, your, your close friend stabs you in your back, when your sister or your brother uh, stab you in the back, Sometimes the last thing you could do is effectively fight against powers and principalities. You could pray to God, but you're not really effective because you're so emotionally sick and weak. That's why he tells us to call for the elders of the church. Call for those that are married so that they could come and sing over you. Now, this scripture, point two of our notes, are, did you find all the notes? Did I miswrite them or anything? Okay. Okay, so now we're on point two. This scripture suggests that a Christian can have times of joy and sorrow caused by affliction, yet are not to remain in a state of affliction. Rather, they are to pray themselves and others out of affliction and enter into the joy of the Lord. You know, nowhere in scripture does God tell you to stay in an afflicted state. But 
there's all, all kinds of scripture references where people prayed and God delivered. People prayed and angels came. People pray, prayed and earthquakes happened. People prayed and mountains were removed. Matthew 25, verse 21. Matthew 25, verse 21. And then Romans 8, 6, and 7. So let's get to Matthew 5, 25. Matthew 25, verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. See, we can enter into the joy of the Lord. We are to be faithful with a few things. And we'll get many things, but the ultimate joy, the ultimate goal is to enter into the joy of the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, ne neither indeed can be. The carnal mind, carnal wisdom does not bring peace. The only thing that brings peace is for you to be faithful on the few things that God has given you to war and fight against powers and principalities to get out of the affliction. You're not at peace. You're not at joy. You're not in the peace of the Lord while you're walking a death march. Let me go here. I moved the computer. I want to make sure it's, it's still seeing me. Yeah. You're, you're walking a death march. Uh, we've been watching a movie lately about Indian, uh, a, a, a series of Indian tribes, uh, reservations. And it just reminded me that this great thing that when I was in Arizona, uh, I grew up on the Navajo Hopi Reservation, the Navajo Reservation specifically. And we all learned about the death march, where they forced the Indians to walk a such a humongous, I don't remember how many miles, but miles and, my, and people just died and died. They fell down dead because they were walking. They were being herded like cattle, but not treated well. They were not delivered out of their affliction, even though they endured it, right? They got, to, the ones that got to the end and made it, they got to the end. They endured it, but they didn't get out of that affliction. They still have anger, bitterness, and hatred. Satan still has a foothold in their life. They still suffered lots, right? God tells us we're to pray our way out of that affliction. How can you pray your way out of that affliction? I recommend you take some, uh, everybody's got computers and stuff. Google some of the great miraculous things God has done for Israel. How one or two men have fought against hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, opposing forces. Oh, and that's the, remember the six day war in our lifetime? How Israel came out from the six day war and those that oppressed him on, on all sides literally just gave up because they were seeing troops that weren't there. They were seeing these massive troops. God, I just remember this one testimony of this group of Israeli soldiers that were walking in the mountains and they come around a turn and uh, the, their opposing forces were just overwhelmingly, I don't know how many it was, I'm going to say, let's say six Israeli soldiers against 20 uh, opposing forces. But the opposing forces, they all dropped their guns. As the Israeli soldiers were like, you know, going in their pants, they see them all drop their guns. And they can't figure out why. They were overwhelming. 
amount of people. They had the upper hand. And when it came time for the interrogation, it was says that they seen all these huge giants, military men, with all this, this military armament, and they just knew that they would be overwhelmed. They weren't there. They were angels. We can pray out of situations. We don't have to endure the affliction. Now, if you do endure and you don't pray out, good for you. But would you rather not go through it and get out of it or go through it and really have all this suffering? You know, you lost your leg. You lost your health. Your daughter died. Your mom died. Two of your kids died. Something like that. You made it. Man, but you made it great. Praise God. Or would you like, praise God. I came down and prayed and there was a gazillion angels there. I'm reminded of the story of Elisha where he calls to his, uh, prays that his servant's eyes be open and he's seen all the chariots of God, all the horsemen of God on the hills. Elijah saying, don't worry. There's more with us than are with them. And they were being outrun by military. The king trying to kill them. Okay. We can pray ourselves out. But most Christians don't do it. American Christians are the weakest, pansiest group of people on the face of the earth. We are. But we don't fight against human beings. We don't take up our guns and our clubs to fight against human beings. We take up our power to fight against principalities, and power in heavenly places. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but we do fight. And if you don't fight, what happens? You suffer. How does one pull themselves out of affliction when they are sorrowful? By calling on someone else. That is not being afflicted at the present time. And have them pray over you. Their prayer of faith will deliver you out of despair. So that the Lord can raise you up. Now guys, I do not have to be a drug addict to minister to a drug addict. However, if somebody has gone through drugs and been delivered and know the fight. They could come minister pretty effectively to somebody else. You know, if you're fighting drugs and, and this other person won, you know, you could look to him and say, yeah, I can see it won. It worked. Where if they look at somebody that hasn't been an issue in that issue, they go, well, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It'll work, but I don't see any proof of it. So when you call somebody who's married to come alongside you, the odds are, because they're Christian in their life, that they have suffered affliction. But they're the elders of the church. They know how to fight. They know how to get out of sickness and disease. They've learned to not be saying, hey, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You know, God's in control. God gave you control. God wants you to fight against the devil. Point B, this is why the merry are to sing songs. By singing songs, they pull their brethren out from under the afflictions of the rich. Now, we can sing the word of God, but if you spoke Hebrew, Hebrews is what is called a sing-song language. It's made to be sung. That's how people could memorize Hebrew so so well because it's a song how many of you have listened to a song maybe from a commercial and as soon as you hear that song you know exactly that it, that's a mcdonald's commercial bum, 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 bum. right you know that's a mcdonald's commercial so singing and the word of god is how god could use that to pull it out of your brain the most effective way so we're to sing the words of God. Why? Not so that we remember it, so that the person that's sick or the person that's being afflicted knows it. 
can recall it. Because they're in pain. They might have just got their leg shot off and their, ba their husband dead on the floor. And you start singing psalms and it comes back. Wow. The word of God comes back to the... That was the... the the word of God comes back to the brain. Do you, are you guys starting to hear? It's not so much that we just like, oh, God, I praise you. You're so great and awesome. And, and God says, wow, you guys really love me. I think I'm going to get up and go fight for you. No, it's we sing the word of God. So the word of God comes out from the treasures of our heart. So the word of God that's in our brain comes up so that we can fight against powers and principalities. How do we fight against them? By the word of our testimony and the blood of Jesus. Not by getting an AK-47. Not by rioting. Not by protesting. But by singing the word of God. Making any sense? No? Glassy eyed. James chapter 5, <laughs> verses 14 and 16. Is any among you... Uh, I'm sorry, the, the alarm went off. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he had committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Many followers, point one, okay, on your study notes, if you go on to this, after James chapter 5, 14 and 16, point one, many followers of Christ have had their faith shattered after having been prayed for by elders in Christ, yet were not healed. Not being able to reconcile this passage from their experience, they become filled with unbelief and begin to suffer even more destruction in their life. Can you guys agree with that statement? Many people have prayed that their mom and dad don't die. And they died as a young kid. Now that's why I'm not going to follow God. Because God didn't heal. And I prayed. Their faith was shattered. If that is a true statement, which it is, it has happened to many people. We need to remember the context of the portion of James letter is or that this portion of James letter is addressing those suffering affliction from the rich, not disease. It's not talking about praying over somebody who who is in a car accident. Or has leukemia. It's praying, it's talking, the context is talking about those that are suffering the affliction of the rich. The battle. Because remember, all the other places, the sick are raised just by faith. You just prayed a word. You didn't anoint them in oil. Nowhere else in scripture does it show where the anointing of the oil ever healed anybody. The anointing of oil only equipped people to do a given, a given task. It only gave them authority to be a king, to be a prophet, to be a priest. This is not talking about if you're sick, having leukemia, call for the elders, and they'll come and anoint you with oil, and the, pr the prayer of faith to heal you that the oil had something to do it. I know there's a lot of business out there. They talk about healing oil, these essential oils out there. That's not what this scripture is talking about. Not at all. It's not in scripture. I'm sorry. Those of you that say it is, you are misled and greatly deceived. And no one deceives you 
Remember, no one deceives you unless they want to take something from you. Those, the use of oil for anointing was to empower the recipient to complete, come on, a given task commissioned of the Lord. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Uh, some call it Ramah, Raham. But at any rate, that's where, where he goes. See, the oil, and many places in Scripture, matter all places in Scripture, is where somebody's anointed to have the power of the Lord on them, not to be healed of sickness and disease. Therefore, I conclude James is not talking about somebody who has sickness and disease, but because it's in the context of the affliction of the rich, and every single other place in the Bible is about giving somebody supernatural ability from God to accomplish the cast, that you are given supernatural ability to God to fight against the devil and come out of this affliction. The phrase, the sick, you can look at song, uh, Strong's uh, 2577, Camille, is translatable to being worried which fits the context of those suffering affliction from the rich, better than suffering from pain, etc. So the phrase, the sick, is those of you that are tired of fighting the battle will be raised up, not those that have cancer. Whole different issue. God heals you from cancer. But we're talking about people that are oppressing you. You know, we prayed with our neighbor. Now, we didn't fervently pray with him because his mind was carnal-minded. But he was being afflicted by the rich. He was falsely accused of molesting his daughter's friend. He lost his marriage. He lost his house. He lost his job. He lost his health, and he eventually died from that. He was completely innocent, and after a very long, was that a couple of years at least, uh, uh, trial or our legal process going through it, finally was acquitted of everything. He went to a jury trial, and he was finally acquitted. Oop, my battery's going low. Because the evidence was falsely being accused, and they were suppressing the rich we're suppressing evidence that would set them free. They had the evidence, the DNA of the man who raped him, and it wasn't his DNA. They had a written confession, but the rich, the district attorney refused to allow, he's no longer our district attorney, thank God, but he would not allow that evidence to be entered into to the case. This is what he's talking about. The oppression of the rich. We need to fight against powers and principalities in heavenly places. That this evil wickedness would come out. And it eventually did. One juror come out and says, it makes no sense that, we, uh, that she went and had a rape kit. And we can't have that, any information whether there was DNA or not. Said they would found sperma, semen, and his mind. God put it in his mind. This makes no sense. And they acquitted him because he said, they, the jury said there's something wrong with the police department. Because there's no way you would go take a person to a rape kit and they find semen and you not do a DNA test on it. And if you did, whose was it? He was acquitted, and he died. Like right after, I don't know, three months, four months after. 
He died. His heart gave out. Young man. That's still young. Come on. There's only one person not in that age group right here. Yeah. Okay. Point four. Those that are in Christ are equipped to run the race. However, many followers of Christ do fall and hurt themselves in this race. Therefore, by merciful, that should be my, therefore, my merciful God has made a way of escape. Now, there was a little confusion. We are to run a race. We are equipped to run a race, but some of us fall and trip and fall. Therefore, because that happens, because God knows that it happened, God being a merciful God has made a way of escape for them, for them that have fallen. Through the anointing of oil and the prayer of faith, he is able to free them from the consequences of their error and raise them up that they may finish the race. Oh, John, you said that, the bad word. They were freed from the consequences of their error. That's what the Bible says. If you're running the race and you fall down and you, and you sprain your ankle, you got to be freed from the consequences of that sprayed ankle to run to finish the race, right? Someone's got to tape, bandage it up or something so that you are no longer inhibited by that. You have to be freed from the consequences. Those of you that have done wrong, the prayer of faith, the word of your testimony and the blood of Jesus Christ will silence the accuser of the brethren, Satan. They will silence. He says, well, you've done that. You say you're following God, but you you just did drugs last week. You come up and you pray, yeah, I thank you for reminding me that. But it's the blood of Jesus that cleansed me of all sin. And I'll sing of the goodness of God. I'll sing of his salvation. I'll sing of his deliverance. I'll sing that I have the mind of Christ. That as God is, so am I in this world. That he has made me perfect and complete. And devil, guess what? Anyone who is born of God cannot sin. Because his DNA is in him. His sperma is in him and he cannot sin. And I've been born of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24. Chapter 10 verse 13. Then we're going to go to 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 7. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may attain it. This is an analogy. It doesn't mean only one person is going to heaven. But it means if you're going to run the race from God, run it like you have to win. Like there's no second place. Run it like you mean it. What is God? Jesus says, I'd rather that you were lukewarm. I mean, hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Run it like you mean it. These people that say they believe in God, but a vote for Democratic Party so that the people could get abortion. God will spew you out of your mouth. You need to run your race and say, no, we do not vote for, we do, will not, do not, and cannot vote for ungodly policies. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful. Who's faithful? God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But with the temptation, 
also makes a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So this scripture says that some Christians will be overtaken. That means they fell into the trials, the temptation. But he reminds them that this isn't such a great temptation that you can't overcome it. And God has made a way of escape from said temptation. Now, this does not have to be a temptation against lust and evil and, and things like that, that most people think that. Temptation is testing. You fought a fight and you've been taken a prisoner. Are you going to give in and aid the enemy? Or are you going to hold strong and fight against the enemy, even though you're in his camp? waiting for an elder, waiting for someone more powerful, mature in Christ to come alongside you and pray you out, help you pray out. Because if you give in, there ain't no hope. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. This is Paul saying he's done. He's run the race. He's Finished the race. He's ready to go home. So what if Paul had died a year before this? He wouldn't have finished a race. But what did God do? God kept him alive. Remember, Paul says he suffered death. Paul said he was stoned. And you know, when people stoned you, they weren't trying to hurt you. They were killing you. That was a form of capital punishment. Paul died and was resurrected from the dead. Now, you and I had a discussion earlier about people losing their salvation. And I said, it's possible, but no one has. It is possible for Paul, if he had died way back then, he wouldn't have been in heaven. He wouldn't have finished the race. But because God is faithful, God raised him from the dead. See, we have an awesome God that will never forsake us. That doesn't mean he's just going to be looking there and crying in heaven because we're being tormented. He will never forsake us. But he gave you the power. Now, what power did Paul have? Or what did Jesus do? I said God raised him from the dead, right? When Paul was stoned. But if we remember the story is the people, the, his disciples or the disciples of Christ came and prayed over Paul and Paul was raised from the dead. See, we're to pray over people to raise them from the dead. Although it's God that raised them from the dead. But if we don't pray over them, if the disciples didn't pray over Paul, Paul would probably died right then. And I did say probably because you never know what really happens until it happens. As previously stated by James, he tells those who are worried to call for the elder, elders, those who are mature in Christ, to pray over them. He continues to expand the qualifications for deliverance, which involves the confession of your faults to one another. Why confess your faults, which are not sins, so that the prayer warrior knows what doors have been opened that allows demons to work in your life, that they may know how to pray for your deliverance in the heavenly court of law. This is why when you pray for somebody, sometimes you have. Like, what did you do wrong? What's your fault? And you say, well, I went and played poker and, and I lost all the money. And that money wasn't my money. It was my the rent money. And therefore, I stole the rent money. I sold my grandmother social security check to pay for my drugs. You've opened a door. How am I going to pray for you unless I know what door's open? 
Now, thank God that the Holy Spirit knows that we're dealing with prideful people and he'll give us the discerning of spirits. He'll give us supernatural knowledge. And sometimes, like when Des and I do deliverance, we'll be in there in, in, uh, right here in this room and God will tell us what happened to them as a young kid, a young child. And we'll tell them that. And then, yeah, they confess. And you did this. But we always ask them first. But see, they're so unwilling to do it. And remember, let's go to Revelations chapter 12, verse 10, 11, and Ephesians 6, 12. Huh? Thunder, yeah. I remember in, 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 in when I was talking to guys incarcerated, there was this one guy that was pretty tough dude. And he was being tormented by demons. And he was making all kinds of problems. And I told him to shut up in the name of Jesus and sit down on his hands. And he did. He was so humiliated. And I told him, after, I told him we could set you free of that demon that's in you. And, and we prayed and prayed. And he finally says, I don't want to be. Because that demon, he knew that demon gave him supernatural power to win fights. And if he didn't, he didn't want to get beat up. So he did not want it. How did I find that out? By the confession. Okay. Revelation 12, 10 through 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Yes, this is a future event. This is the recalling of a future event when Satan gets cast down. But this is talking about how the saints overcame the accuser, how the saints overcame the devil when the devil accused them day and night. They overcame the devil by the word of their testimony and the blood of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts in high places. Now, when we were talking about this whole election process, my wife and I are completely different sides of the matter. She's on the right side and I'm on the incorrect side. That, yes, that's how. That being said, I hate listening to these commentaries, even though everything they say is the truth. I say they're on the same side as the opposing. They're opposing sides. They're following the dictates of the devil. They're doing the will of the devil just as much as the other things because they're not fighting against principalities and power. They're fighting against individuals. And there's no way we could come against, I'll just say it, Nancy Pelosi. But we could pray for her salvation. We could bind and fight against the demons that are acting in her life. And if she became a Christian, you think she would be doing the things she's doing? We don't need to put her in prison. We don't need to trap her in a lie. Because it doesn't really matter. When every all the judges are liars... <laughs> You know, if you go and you take it to and they just cast it out of court, we're not going to listen to it because they're corrupt. It's not going to make any difference. So they were right. Every accusation they made, I believe, was 100% accurate. But that's not where we are to fight. I told him if that guy was really a Christian, he would be a calling us all Christians to prayer. Don't go and protest. Get on your knees and fight. Don't go sell your support. Get on your knees corporately and fight the prayer of faith. Just two different ways of looking at it. An example. 
you might withheld help from your brother when he was suffering the afflictions of the evil one, you are condemned. Remember, we, we studied this uh, last week. If you grudge, have a grudge against your brother, you are condemned. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. So when I pray for you as an elder or a mature one in Christ, I need to find out, well, are you condemning? Are you grudging your brother? Are you? Did you withhold helping your brother? Your brother came and asked you money. Your brother in Christ came and asked you to lend him some money so he could pay his credit card bill off. And you had the extra money. You found a wallet with no ID and an extra thousand dollars in it. And you went out and bought stereo equipment, got, uh, something you didn't need. And your brother came and asked and said, hey, man, I'm having a real problem with my credit card. I'm fighting. I got these people are taking money out, putting it on there. Uh, I was like, gave them access to get into my account. Uh, a gym membership or a, a medical deal or something. Anyway, I can't get in. I can't pay. I have no money. You give me some money? And you go, nope. You just opened a doorway for Satan to come in your life. How am I going to pray if I don't know that? You need to confess your faults and to one another. And then we do it. It's not a sin. Those that are in Christ have not, cannot sin. It's not breaking one of God's laws. You're not under the law. But it gives Satan access to cause problems in your life. And a week you pray out, so now you don't have to suffer the consequences. Yeah, you did it. It opened the door. But if somebody comes in because I left the door open, all I got to do is kick them out. And then maybe I should lock the door. But all I got to do is get them out. And I'm no longer suffering the consequences. All you got to do is get the devil out of you. And you don't suffer the consequences. The consequences are the result of the devil, not the result of your evil actions. James, five minutes. James chapter 5, 17 through 18. Elias was a man subject with, to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elias, known as Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we, yet his prayers were powerful. He was like any other man wanting to be free from the affliction of the king Ahab and his wife, which were directed towards him. Nevertheless, when the Lord tells him to pray for a drought, he fervently prays and the drought comes upon the land, knowing this would cause discomfort and lack for all Israel. He puts his trust in the Lord for his provision, showing us the desire for the rich to oppress or persecute the godly is so overwhelming that when Elijah prayed for an abundance of rain to come and end the drought, he doesn't receive honor but suffers more persecution for him. So, in other words, Elijah. A man just like us, but he's not filled with the Holy Spirit. The, or he's not, the Holy Spirit's not living inside him. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not dwelling. So we have a more powerful prayer life than he has. But he, being a man, following God, had set and fervently prayer, had so much power that he stopped it from raining on the earth. Now, did God tell him to do that? Yes, God told him to do that. And yes, he prayed. Knowing, I mean, think about it. Would you go up and pray for there to be a drought, an economic disaster to America? 
knowing that it would hurt you, right? If if, if America suffers a goes to an economic collapse, it would hurt you. Yeah, Elijah, Elijah did it knowing that God would protect him. What did God do? God provided a raven to go bring food to him in a drought situation where there was water coming out of a rock. Then he goes and he prayed. When that rock dries up, he goes and prays. He goes to a widow's house. Only one widow in all of Israel does God go and save. Who makes us a promise that he's the defender of the widows and orphans. There was in all of Israel, northern Israel. This was northern Israel at the time, not southern Israel. This is what they were called Israel, the northern tribes. There was only one widow that was not engaging in idolatry. There was only one widow, because God is the defender of the widows. But that one widow was delivered. And Elisha comes and they get the oil and the oil goes and builds up and they're eating and they never run out of food until the drought's over. First Kings, uh, we could read a lot of chapter 17, verse 1. I'm going to be skipping over it. You need to read the whole chapter yourself. But let's go to First Kings, chapter 17. Talk about the story of Elijah. Verse 1, and then 3 and 4. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these three years, but according to my word. So Elisha already says it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherub, that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. See, so there's going to be a drought. Elisha's going to suffer. Let's say he got a, a job. He's a car salesman. Can't sell any cars anymore. Just go over there and I'll, I'll have the ravens bring you food. You know, do you think this was old dead carcasses? I bet you, I don't know, but this, just the way my God is, I bet you that raven went in the king's palace as Ahab and Jezebel were eating their filet mignon. The raven came and scooped it up, flew up, and brought it to, <laughs> brought it to Elijah. That's just the way my God is. I could see him do it. That's not in scripture, guys. 1 Kings 18, verse 1, verse 36, and verse 37. 1 Kings, now chapter 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So who's going to send rain upon the earth? God is, but only by the word of Elijah. Elijah doesn't say it. It's not going to happen. And it came to pass at the end of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art, that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their hearts back again. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is sound of an abundance rain. Now, can you imagine there being a major drought in an area, and this guy who was your enemy, prays for the rain to come to drop. Wouldn't you, like, reward him? Wouldn't you, like, all is forgiven? Man, this is great. I'm glad it's over. I'm glad you're 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 doing it because we were all going to die. Don't you think that would be a logical conclusion? You would think so, but it's not. 
because the rich are always those that oppress you. Even if you deliver them, they're going to bite you. Now, those born of God have even more authority than Elijah had. Thus, when we pray, we have the assurance our prayers will be answered. We don't have to sit there and beg to be like Elijah, thinking that Elijah was more powerful than us. We are more powerful than Elijah, according to the word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 15. And we know that he hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire. So we know that when Christians pray, Christians know that our Father hears us. So we know that if he hears us, he'll give us the petition we ask. Hmm. Acts chapter 4, verse 9, and then 16 and 17. If we this day be examined of good deeds done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole, saying, What shall we do to these men? For they indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifested to all that dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it but that it spread no further among the people let us sternly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name could you imagine the leaders of Israel having this guy, a false servant to Israel, a brother, who was sick, I mean lame, get healed? Why wouldn't you rejoice with him? He did good. Wow, Jesus really is our Savior. He really did come to set us free. He really now is establishing that the lame will walk. But what do they do? Wow, this is a notable miracle. This is so powerful. What's, what are we going to do? We got to fight against Paul, or Peter, I'm sorry, in this position. We got to fight against them so that they no longer preach this. See, the rich oppress you. James 19 and 20. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from error of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. On my study notes, we're at point one. James ends this letter on a positive note. Those who are in Christ have and have been deceived into following the doctrine of demons can be delivered from the trap of the devil. You can. He's not just going to like throw you away, lose your salvation, right? 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. Now this is Paul telling Timothy what he should do. He should, in meekness, Instructing the, those that oppose themselves if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You open a doorway to Satan, he could come take you captive at his, at his will. But his will, he may not do it. That's why so many people get away with it. Well, we've done it and nothing happened to me. And you look at, well, they did it and nothing happens to them. And you do it and you die. Those who are being persecuted by the rich can be delivered. Okay. These are the points. He's making these points. Acts 12, 7, 11, and 12. So Acts chapter 12, verse 7, 11, and 12. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. 
and his chains fell off his hands. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, no, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. See, we didn't, they didn't go and storm the prison. They didn't go and try to uh, stir up a rebellion. They came together and prayed. And an angel of the Lord came from heaven and basically set Peter free. The chains just fell off of him. He walks right out of prison. That's where a warfare needs to be, in the powers and principalities. Now, those who are rich and ungodly, those who are rich and ungodly, can be converted through the power of God. So all these rich people that are oppressing you, that doesn't mean they can't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be your blessed friend. I mean, look at Saul, who became Paul, or Paul, who used to be Saul. He was persecuting Christians, then he became a Christian. Those that persecute you can become your brother in Christ. you got to be willing to accept that. Matthew 19, 23 through 26. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it's very hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And as when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Concluding, Christ has given Christians the authority to use his power to deliver themselves when persecuted from the expectations the expected in the rich had for them. This deliverance is for the utmost importance that Christians may spread the gospel to reconcile the loss to the Father. So one of the most effective ways to bring a rich man to Christ is to show him that his riches can accomplish his deeds. If his riches can't harm you, and he sees that you got a power and authority greater in his riches, he now questions his riches. And he starts looking and says, wow, there's something greater. So it's not submitting and humbly down to the oppression of the rich that brings the rich to Christ. It's fighting against the rich. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 through 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with two tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is such an awesome, incredible, Incredible verse that people have said that it doesn't even belong in the Bible, that it was added to the Bible. Because it says, if you're a believer of God, these things shall follow you. These signs. One, to speak to God in a language that no man can know. They shall speak with new tongues. God gives you a heavenly language 
so that no man or demon could understand you, but only God. This was not a language that other people understood that God gave you the supernatural ability to speak. This is a language that no man knows or understands, but God gives the in, uh, spirit of interpretation, our gift of interpretation, so that you or somebody else can interpret it. Two, to be able to cast out demons with just a word. The horse said, in my name they shall cast out devils. See, before they had these intern uh, exorcists, these Jewish exorcists that went out and they cast out demons. But they weren't really effectual. They had a lot of rituals, pouring maybe water, casting, doing all kinds of things on them. And, and sometimes it happened, sometimes it didn't. They weren't very effective. But you have the ability to do it just in the name of Jesus with a word. You don't have to shout. You don't have to stand on your hand. You don't have to pour holy water on them. You don't have to put a cross on them. They don't have to puke. Hey, come on. We Haven't we had all these things, these people that have had demons, they, they, you know, they say they're going to puke and they put paper all over the floor and that and I said in the name of Jesus you are not gonna puke and she stopped puking her throat closed up and just like says I ain't cleaning that mess up I don't care you know because I have the power and authority over that devil to fight against those who are doing the devil's will you have the power to fight against those who do the devil's will they shall take up serpents. Who's a serpent? Serpents are, 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 are another word, a, a synonym for devil, for demons. What does it mean to take up? You will fight against them. They won't beat you. You will beat them. And then to be delivered from any poison the rich might give you. See, the scripture says, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. Well, who given them the deadly thing? The rich. So I talk to people, they say about this COVID-19 vaccine, how bad it is, and that it's demonic, and it, you shouldn't take it. And I won't take it unless I'm forced. But if I'm forced to take it, I got this scripture that it, no deadly thing, if I drink or take no deadly thing, it will not harm me. I don't care what evil intent they put on there. But guess what? If I don't say that, if I don't believe that, I will suffer the consequences that this vaccine may have. See, God's given us a way of escape from every, every action the rich have against us. Now, to actually, he also tells us that these signs shall believers to actually pray and lay hands on the sick and see them recover. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And now we're done, guys. Okay, so again, my conclusion is we do have, God did suffer and be whipped so that you could be healed of a physical disease. But please don't think that pouring oil on you, which I have done so many times, I know, I understand it, is going to heal you. Okay? The, pray, the uh, anointing someone with oil is equipping them with supernatural power to come out from the affliction of the evil one. Two different scripture references. That's why Jesus was whipped in Pilate's praetorium getting whipped to fillet, the skin filleted right off of him. Why would he do that if all you had to do is go put some oil on? It'd say, hey, take stock, every one of you Christians, make sure you grow some olive trees. Okay, I want you to always walk with olive oil. When he sent out the disciples, he didn't give them horns of olive oil. He just gave them his power and authority, and they cast out demons and inhaled people with just a word. Yes, can you turn off the the life and I will turn this off? Okay, stop.